the number one reason for moving to the cloud is security. In the whole IT sector, it's people. Technologies by themselves don't make decisions, they're just prediction engines. In cloud, we are extremely conscious about sustainability and energy usage. What advices would you give to business leaders that are just starting to explore the possibilities of cloud computing? Start small, don't boil the ocean. If you want to go through digital transformation, you really need to change your DNA as a company to be able to become innovative. And then the success will follow. Hello and welcome to the Success Business Podcast. I'm Ku Kan, your host. Uh, today I'm welcoming a very special guest coming from the largest online retailer in the world, Amazon. This gentleman is responsible for driving the company's customer-centric technology vision. As someone's behind Amazon's cloud computing strategy, he's very passionate in helping young businesses scale globally and transforming enterprises into fast-moving digital organizations. So please join me to welcome Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Amazon, Dr. Werner Vogel. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm very well. I have a, having a great time. I love going back to Southeast Asia and especially Vietnam. I think yes. sort of the, the entrepreneurial culture in Vietnam really appeals to me. And anything we can do here to help business get off the ground is, is our, our passion. Great. What brought you to Vietnam this time? I always try to get back to countries that I think is going to have a disproportional impact on the technology world. And I think Vietnam, with its, its very young demographic, its excellent educational system, um, with, many engineer, with many engineers coming out of schools, I think we'll have a great future in terms of providing the rest of the world right. with technology services. Right. I mean, if you've been in Vietnam for the last couple of weeks, yep. I'm sure you understand about what we been you know talking about right now is the work of digital transformation yeah. i'm wondering what kind of impact that cloud computing have on the journey of digital transformation yeah. for many business here in vietnam yeah I, I i think the best way to look at it especially if you look at sort of more i mean i always like to make the the, the difference between younger businesses that actually have no legacy and just can get started off the ground versus enterprises that yeah. already have a legacy um, if we look at enterprises first, there's a, a great paper by Nick Carr many years ago in Harvard Business Review that says IT doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. He didn't mean that IT didn't matter, but if everybody has to do the same IT, it's not a competitive differentiator. Right. So investing in that is actually wasted money from a business perspective. So really thinking about what are the kind of heavy lifting in IT that every company has to do is sort of the kind of task that Amazon's cloud computing division, AWS, has taken on, mm -hmm. where we started off with doing what I would call infrastructure as a service, compute, storage, databases, security, networking. But slowly and surely, they go out to a well over 200 different services because it turns out that Enterprises have many of these requests, whether it's around IoT, whether it's around machine learning, whether it's around analytics, whether it's about mobile development, robotics. All of these areas have what we call heavy lifting, things that you need to do that doesn't, doesn't differentiate you. And, and so that's really the focus of Amazon's cloud computing division. And enterprises have really, really gravitated towards that because they really want to focus on being unique and building unique capabilities for their customers versus doing the same thing as everybody else has to do. Now, if I think about the startup segment, that's very different. Again, there was a Harvard Business Review paper that, that credited AWS, Amazon's cloud computing division, with a quadrupling of the number of startups that have been born. Because in the past, you would need millions of dollars to get started as a young business. These days, what is it, $10,000, $50,000 is enough because you can get capabilities from AWS at a much lower cost than that you would be able to get that in the past. You think about in the past, the way that you would acquire IT would be to write a really big check up front mm -hmm. before you could get access to server capabilities or databases. And these days, you only pay for what you've used. Mm -hmm. So 
If he's not very popular, you probably don't have a big bill. Mm. Yeah? And the same goes for, for many of the inter enterprises. They have really wanted to move away from this so almost sort of um, where the vendor was in control instead of the customer, where you actually had to write big checks. And so you rather become, if you want to go through digital transformation, you want to become as an enterprise as fast as that the young business is moving. And for that, you need to be able to be experimental. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to bring new products out in the market really quickly and then figure out whether that actually works or not. Now, in the past, you know, you would have to put up significant capital for that. These days, it's just a fraction of that cost. And at the same time, you get capabilities that you would never have been able to get before. Yeah, so with uh, AWS, you guys can speed up that process. Absolutely, and think about... And with less investment in cost. Oh, totally. And also, you have an opportunity to become more experimental. I think if you think about enterprises that want to move fast, that, for example, in financial services, that want to compete against younger banks and younger financial services, you need to be able to bring products out to your customers really quickly. Right. And so... That requires you to be able to no longer be sort of stuck in the old model and old mindset of having to acquire IT capabilities first before you can do this. Mm -hmm. You can be experimental and get really quick. And if your customers like it, you can double down on it. Right. If you look at those uh, clients that Amazon have mm -hmm. here in Vietnam, um, Amazon Web Services have here in Vietnam, what is the the general overview picture of the status of the cloud migration right now? I mean, I where are we at right now? Well, I, th I think in general, Vietnamese enterprises are really looking towards digital transformation. Yeah. Uh, and why? Because there's also at the same time, a whole group of young businesses coming up that is trying to eat your lunch. Yeah. And so to be able Enterprises want to move as fast as that these young businesses want. And if you look at companies like, for example, VP Bank or, or Techcom Bank or others, all are looking towards cloud to help them with this digital transformation so that they can move as fast as that the young banks can. I see that cloud uh, computing technology really creates so many opportunities for growth and innovation. But the process of moving to cloud really do have some challenges. What do you think are the biggest challenges for this process? I, I think technology is not a problem here. I think every company really understands the kind of capabilities that cloud is offering. But as always, I think in the whole IT sector, it's people. Yeah? Really being able to not only sort of acquire the technology, but how do we actually create a, a digital transformation mindset? Mm. Yeah? If you've before hired your engineers to be very conservative because they needed to keep the databases on and their SAP system running. And you wanted to be conservative. Mm -hmm. You can't blame those people to not be the innovators and not be the fast movers. Right. You really need to change your DNA as a company to be able to become innovative and to be able to move fast. So for that, you need to have a different organizational structure that is really focused on sort of moving faster. Mm -hmm. For that, you need to hire different people. You need to have people with a different mindset in terms of innovation, in terms of drive. And I think not just in Vietnam, this is globally. Yeah, I, I just came back from Germany, for example, where there are 80,000 open IT positions. And, and there, the largest they're companies like the BMWs right yeah. and the Porsches and the Volkswagens of this world all are looking for hiring more engineers that can be innovative. As such, the same challenges here in Vietnam. And I, I think what you see here is just a global perspective. We really need more engineers. We really need these engineers to be truly focused on the innovation. And then the success will follow. What kind of lesson that we can learn from the U.S. markets in terms of changing mindset, creating a digital transformation mindset? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest differences between, let's say, the U.S. market and the other global markets is that the U.S. is willing to invest more in digital technology right. and 
actually significantly more. Even if you compare it to Western Europe, which we consider to be sort of on par with the US, in the US there is about five times as much investment in technology and in fast-moving te technology than there is in the rest of the world. So the investment in sort of moving faster is clearly there in the US, where I think the rest globally of the rest of the world is sort of lagging behind there. It's more conservative. But I think most companies start to understand that they're not only competing here in Vietnam or here in Southeast Asia, yeah. companies are competing globally. And to be able to be compete globally, you need to be active globally and invest like the other companies do as well. Sure. I see that technology is changing so fast and, you know, keep evolving. And what's some of the emerging trends right now in cloud computing that you are most mm. excited about? I mean, something well, that shaped this industry in the coming years. Well, I, I think one of the, the central things that I'm seeing with most companies is, is the importance of data and data-driven decision-making. Yeah, where in, in the past, let's say storage was very expensive. For example, in a hospital, in the past, you would be forced to keep your data around for 30 years. But they couldn't do this digitally. Right. Even the CAT scans and the MRI scans were actually archived on film instead of in the digital format. Now cloud enables it to actually store this data digitally and you can start comparing digital imagery. Most companies in the past were very conservative about exactly what data they would store and they would store it in a relational database. These days, with storage being so cheap in the cloud, companies basically keep all their data around mm. that they have. And they also start to figure out that there may be pots of gold in this data that they haven't seen before. And in the past, you would do that by having some sort of relational query of your database. But these days, with these large amounts of data that companies can have around, is making use of analytics techniques like machine learning and AI to actually look for pots of gold in the data that they have. Yeah. Yeah. For example, take even take a company like Amazon. You know, we've been making use of these techniques for a long time. We basically sit on billions of orders from the past. We know exactly which ones were fraudulent and which ones were not. So you can make models out of that, that if a new order comes in, you can give it a score. What's the likelihood that this is a fraudulent order? And then have a human investigate it. It's still humans that make decisions. Mm -hmm. Technology only helps you make predictions in that sense. So I think a lot of the technologies that we see that companies are looking for are all around helping them make data-driven decision-making. Yeah, really looking for what kind of decisions can I make based on data from the past. And so I think that's, that's really where most companies are moving towards, helping them either innovate, go in new directions, or become more efficient, mm -hmm. or start looking at, are there new businesses that we could go in based on the knowledge that we have from the past? Technologies are not concerned about the truth, where we have to figure out what is the right use of this technology. Technologies by themselves don't make decisions, they're just prediction engines. Different societal rules that decide how this technology can be applied in their society. Right, I see you mentioned AI and machine learning and people nowadays, uh, you know, crazy about JetGPT and those kind of stuff. What is your thought on that? I mean, how do you inco incorporate those strategy and technology into yeah. cloud offering? Yeah, oh, uh, first of all, I, I think we need to make a sort of um, a separation between what I would call task-based models and the new large language models. If you look at the task-based models from the past, um, which we were really good at, uh, facial recognition, object detection in video, uh, natural language processing, uh, uh, document scanning and understanding what's in those documents and things like that. Those tasks we are really, really good at already. Uh, they are something is called supervised learning. Basically, someone had to tag the objects before, before you could learn. There is a new technology around the corners based on what's called the transformer model, which allows you to do unsupervised learning. That means you no longer have to tag the data, but you can just basically learn on all the data that there is in the world. And so that is actually really in its infancy. The challenge with that is learning on all the data in the world is that it takes a long time to train, basically months. Yeah. And it takes millions and millions of dollars to do this and also very importantly takes an enormous amount of energy yeah so it's not the most sustainable approach in the world 
Um, so we see that a number of companies are building these very large language models and are there now experimenting with. Um, ChatGP, of course, is being a great example because it became a, a consumer-facing technology. And as such, suddenly everybody is amazed about what these things can do. But we already knew that for quite a while. Right. The problem is with these technologies, with the newer te technology that we really need to start to figure out is that these technologies are not concerned about the truth. They are really concerned about what's the next word that looks really good in this particular context. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, and as such, I think the challenge with that we're facing at this particular moment is that these te technologies look amazing, have enormous potential, but we need to figure out exactly where we can apply these technologies such that these technologies by themselves don't make decisions. They're just prediction engines, just like the other things that we had in the past. Humans still are the ones that make the decisions. Yeah. So for that, we need to understand which of these are generated by AI and maybe false, because J AI doesn't care, it's just a prediction engine. Yeah, and where the humans can understand where this is good for them to understand and help them. Now, there's a number of areas that are already working quite well with these large models. Mm -hmm. For example, in support of programming languages, of developers. Yeah, developers have a lot of mundane tasks that they normally go out on some website and mm -hmm. search for something and then do copy and paste and then put it in their code. Mm -hmm. And we now have these tools and technologies like, for example, Code Whisperer, that allows, that helps, that assists developers with their mundane tasks, right. but they still are responsible for what they've been writing. Yes, it's very exciting. I think lots of companies are trying to figure out exactly what, what the use is for their particular business. And a number of these are, are already quite, let's say, targeted. Bloomberg, for example, has developed their own model yeah. based on all the financial data that they have. And as such, that's a very narrow model where they can support other financial companies with decision making. Mm -hmm. But it's still the companies that make the decisions, it's the humans that make the decisions. This is only sort of a supporting technology right. in that. It's going to take time. I mean, I do see some people concerning about the ethical use of those technology, you know, try to prevent um, potential biases in Absol algorithm. Absolutely. What, what is your take on that? Absolutely. And uh, as always, you know, garbage in means yeah. garbage out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for example, there's, there's an area there where where we have we I mean where technologists have tried to apply AI to is for example in recruiting. If you are a company that has lots of people like me, like middle-aged white guys, yeah, and if you put that data into your recruiting model, what you're going to recruit is more middle-aged white guys. And as such, removing the bias from your original data sets also should result in, let's say, a more fair, and so what we call there is understandability. Can we understand what these, why these models make these decisions for you, or decisions, or why they pre give you these predictions? And much of that is, is also societal driven. Yeah, for example, if you take London, in London, if you've ever seen British TV crime dramas, you know that there are tens of thousands of CCTV cameras around. Apparently, people in London have no problem with being supervised. Yeah? However, if you would do that in Amsterdam or in Berlin, that would be not an option. Yeah? And so it's different societies, different societal rules that decide how this technology can be applied in their society. U.S. people may make different decisions, or U.S. governments may make dis different decisions versus the Vietnamese or uh, the Indians or maybe in the Middle East. And as such, I think, as a society, we go through these changes, these technology changes, where we have to figure out what is the right use of this tech, tech technology. Right. Yeah, in, as I said, in London, facial recognition, not a problem. Yeah. In, however, in a number of other countries, that might be really a problem because they have a very different notion of privacy and sensitivity around that. I see that many industries right now are beneficial from the use of cloud technology, such as the music and video industry. And now we see some sport industry are you know, yeah. rising as well. How do you foresee the future of those industries that uh, you know, get the most impact from cloud computing? Yeah. I, I think if you look at sports, sports is, and I think we all love, <laughs> I love sports. Yeah, we, do, yeah, we all I'm do. A big Ajax <laughs> fan, uh, Ajax Amsterdam, 
So just to make a, <laughs> a point for that. Yeah. Uh, no, but if you look at sort of, if you look at the big football clubs, uh, yep. whether it's Barcelona or Bayern Munich or Manchester United. That's my, that's my club. <laughs> Manchester United? Yeah. Okay, good. Dutch, a Dutch manager in these yeah, days. Yep, so yep. their use of technology is extremely advanced. Yeah, if you see these days players on the field, they all wear a harness right. with also the sensors in it. They continuously track track that and make use of the data from that to improve player performance. Mm. The idea is that we should be able to take this technology and actually bring it to the masses. Why shouldn't actually small young amateur players not have access to this technology? If you look at young companies like Vio from, from Denmark or Huddle from the US, they're all companies that actually bring this technology to amateur sports. They're basically cameras, uh, they have a panoramic camera, they, they track the whole play, and then make use of machine learning and AI to advise coaches about sort of how they can improve gameplay. And especially in for the younger audience, it's very important because so the young players these days, they're all grown up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. They all know right. snacking. And so give them a really small video clip of them to improve their performance. They will actually immediately catch on instead of just the coach talking to them and saying, you should have done this. Mm -hmm. Show it to them and they immediately can, can improve. So really democratization of this technology and bring it to everyone is something that cloud computing enables. Yeah. And one of the concerns right now is the cloud security. How is AWS addressing the concern? What kind of step are you taking to ensure the safety and the privacy of customer data? Yeah, first and foremost, it's important to realize that in the past, if you, if you would have asked me, why do customers want to move to the cloud? It's because they want to move faster. They want to save costs. They want to have their product, their engineers be more pro 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 productive. These days, the number one reason for moving to the cloud is security. Mm -hmm. Most of our customers realize, especially large enterprises, realizing they cannot make the same investments that Amazon is making mm -hmm. in their security. And, and, and as such, security will be forever our number one investment area, both from an intellectual capital point of view as well as from financial capital. Mm -hmm. And as such, we're also able to innovate in these areas by building new technologies that protect individual customers. You know, in the past, the same security will be applied to everyone. But accessing your services or your products versus someone else's products may be very different. So again, we make use of sort of technologies like machine learning to figure out what is your unique model? How is your unique access pattern to your services? Right. Build a model out of that, and then we can alarm you on something that is out of the ordinary. But each customer is different. And as such, we build these unique models for each of our customers so that we can protect them in the individually. And, and so whether that is around account access or whether it's around data access, all of these technologies are unique for each of these customers. So I, from my point of view, security in the cloud is superior to what many of our customers can get by themselves. Right. And customers know that. If you look at the past three, four years, as technologists, we should be embarrassed about the number of data breaches that we've seen. Mm -hmm. All of these data breaches are not happening in the cloud, they happen on premise. And why? Because, you know, the, the bad actors, they have all the advantages. You know, they, they pay better salaries, they hire more PhDs, they buy up complete ISP networks. The software only needs to work for five minutes. So we need to make sure that, you know, security is not a line in the sand that says this is good enough. It's a continuously moving target where Amazon and other cloud computing companies can continue to invest in to make sure that we can continue to protect our customers ahead of the bad actors. E-commerce has become way more efficient because of the use of cloud computing. Moving towards more human-centric interfaces, I think is definitely one of the areas that we'll see happening in the coming years. So you need to be ready for how to develop in 2025 instead of in 2015. Hmm. So how do you see the e-commerce, the online retailer, your industry now is being involving in the next coming years? Uh, especially with the use of cloud computing. Any consumer service uh, can benefit from cloud computing. Yeah? If you think about that sort of daily use of your service, probably has uh, peaks and, and, and downs. Yeah? Um, in the past, as, my, as Amazon CTO, I would have to buy hardware, what we call 15% over expected peak. That basically means that sort of 
40 to 50 percent of your hardware sits unused during a week. But even worse, look in the US, for example, uh, after Thanksgiving we have this thing called Black Friday, yeah. where 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 <laughs> traffic is four to yeah. five times as high as normally. So that's the level of hardware I needed to buy against. That means that about 75% of my hardware sits unused for months, only to be able to deal with that peak. And so cloud computing helps you to be able to grow by a single server at a time. And most importantly, it's not only about scaling up, it's about scaling down. Scaling down means you can save cost and you no longer need to pay for, let's say, hardware or capacity that you're not using. And so e-commerce has become way more efficient because of the use of cloud computing. And it's not just Amazon, the retailer, that is making use of this. If you look, for example, in Europe, companies like Zolando, which are the biggest competitors of, of Amazon, are actually also winning on AWS because everybody realizes this is way too good a deal for, for them uh, to be able to not use and to be able to actually be extremely efficient. E-commerce margins are razor thin. So it's extremely important to become very efficient and only pay for that capacity that you really needed to use. I see. I have to talk about one another buzzword in Vietnam beside digital transformation. That is sustainability. Everybody talk about it now as business leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of companies are leveraging technology to you know, make sure that they can achieve sustainable outcome for the businesses. I'm wondering how cloud computing would contribute to a sustainability journey of, yeah. a, of a business. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, you have to realize that if you have your own data centers, if you talk to a CIO, he will tell you that if he has 20% utilization on average, that's really good. Okay. It means that 80% of your energy is going out of the door without actually having supporting any workload. So just moving your workloads over to the cloud already gives you immediately an 80% improvement in your energy usage. Now, at the same time in cloud, we are extremely conscious about sustainability and energy usage. So we have been able to do so much innovation in our data centers to make sure that we lose as little energy as possible. And, and so, for example, um, traditional servers would have a transformer on it that takes AC. However, energy in your data center comes in as DC. Mm. And so having to transform that to AC, because that's that silly transformer that sits on there, if you take all of that out, you do this innovation and around data uh, energy movement within your data centers, you can actually easily reduce your energy usage by 30%. Mm. Next to that, we've been investing in what we call custom silicon basically building new chips, yeah. basically building new CPUs and, and also dedicated chips for, for example, machine learning, and that easily are more 30 to 40% more energy efficient. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. we have a whole program at, at AWS that we call the well-architected framework, and it has to deal with performance and, and fault tolerance and cost efficiency and things like that, but also with sustainability. What are the right cloud technologies that you should be using if you are concerned about sustainability? AWS has as the goal in 2025 to be 100% on renewables. Really? Yeah. And wow. so we are at 80% now. We're getting close to the 100% mark. We are the largest purchaser of renewable energies in the world. And so our goal is really, and not only by purchasing it, we have about 400 sustainability projects going around the world in building wind farms, in building solar farms, and also investing significantly in the storage of renewable energy. Because after all, you know, there's periods that the sun doesn't shine. Mm. Yeah. So can you make sure that you have that energy actually available in downtime periods? Now, that's, that's the things that AWS does. And immediately you see enormous benefits if customers are moving their workloads to the cloud from a sustainability point of view. Uh, and of course, we also give reporting back on that because many of our customers, is, it's interesting, you mentioned sustainability. On one hand, it's a top-down thing. Your board is probably very interested in a sustainability report. But it's also most of your engineers, younger people, are very conscious about sustainability and really want to reduce the energy usage around the world. But also, it's very interesting to see uh, what many of our customers are doing. For example, there's a, there's a very interesting company in, in Bangladesh called SoulShare. 
And they've taken technology which I've seen also being used in, in other communities where there is local energy storage. So in real communities, which normally didn't have very reliable energy production, um, they, you put the solar panels on your roof, and then the community stores the energy locally. It doesn't go back into the grid. And so the other members in the community that may not have solar power or may need this at, at different moments uh, actually can, can draw energy from the local community right. storage instead of having to go to the big grid. Big grids in these rural communities are often unreliable. That meaning that if you're a kid that needs to go to school mm -hmm. and there's no light in the evening, you can't read your books, mm -hmm. you can't do your studying. So it's very important that these local communities can support themselves with technology that runs on top of AWS in IoT and, and analytics and data storage and things like that. Well, a lot of work to do. Um, I see Amazon, uh, people see you as the largest online retailer in the world. But Amazon announced itself as a technology company. Uh, what do you mean by technology factor? And looking forward uh, from a technology perspective, yeah. what innovation do we expect to see? Yeah, well, well, first and foremost, you have to realize that Amazon was always a technology company. Yeah. When, when Jeff Bezos started Amazon, he didn't want to start a bookshop. He was just fascinated by the internet. And the kind of things that you could do on the internet, this is 1994, the world e-commerce mm. doesn't even exist. Yeah? And, and he was looking at the internet and thinking, what can you do there that you cannot do anywhere else? And he just picked books. You know, a really good bookshop has 40,000 titles in stock, mm. maybe. Uh, yet there's millions and millions and millions of books out there in all the different languages. And so he, his goal was, oh, you, this thing that you can do on the internet, you can make a bookshop with all the books of the world in it. Well, didn't really meet that goal yet, but we're, we're still working on it. But all of the things that happened at Amazon, and whether it is recommendations or similarities or all these things, were all technology-driven. It was a technology company from day one. It just, as us as consumers, we never saw that. I almost didn't join Amazon because when they invited me to come and give a talk there was I was an academic. I thought like that's a bookshop. You know, how hard can it be? A web server and a yeah. database. One glimpse in their kitchen and I saw things at an unbelievable scale that I'd never seen before. And so continue to work at sort of this particular level meant that Amazon was growing orders of magnitude year after year. And the technology that we developed for Amazon, actually eventually, similar technology also ended up in a cloud computing division because we saw that other companies also wanted to reach Amazon scale, mm -hmm. but weren't able to afford themselves. They had to buy hardware and hire IT people to, main to maintain the hardware and things like that, which had nothing to do with the products that they were building. Right. And so that actually delivered, came to fruition as, as our cloud computing di division. I think we are looking at sort of um, building more human-centric interfaces, is what I would call it. I mean, Alexa is one of those examples, yeah? There's so many people that are not digital natives, yeah? And that still would like to have access to digital technology, and whether that is your grandmother or whether it's your kids, but also significant portions around the world are not really that great in reading and writing, but they all know how to talk. Yeah, for example, there's... Um, the International Rice Research Institute that sits just outside Manila has developed this technology for smallholder farmers. They don't have a smartphone or anything like that. They're, they're really small farmers. But however, there's a phone in the village and they can actually phone into the Rice Institute and explain in just proper wording the size of their plot of land. And then it will, the automatic AI voice at the other side will give an answer back saying, now, well, this is the amount of fertilizer you have to buy. That's when you have to apply it. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it reduces the amount of fertilizer used by 60%. The mm -hmm. key part there is have human interfaces to digital technologies. Um, you know, the same is that if you look at most of our online systems these days, imagery is all 2D, yeah, two-dimensional. However, three-dimensional technology is how, how we live here. I mean, there's a distance between you and me here. And so being able to bring three-dimensional technology, for example, into whether it's e-commerce or just into building our systems is really crucial because that's how the real world looks like. You know, we talk to each other. Yeah, and 
I see you smile now. So there is an emotion that comes across with that. So be- building, let's say, visual technologies like companies like Soul Machine does, for example, in having um, being able to give you a 3D representation of humans that actually have emotions when they digitally com- uh, uh, converse with you is really important. So moving towards more human-centric interfaces, I think is definitely one of the areas that we'll see happening in the coming years. Wonderful. Um, what advices would you give to business leaders that are just starting to explore the possibilities of cloud computing? Mm-hmm. I mean, how can they best prepare for the future of this industry? As always, start small. <laughs> Don't boil the ocean. Right. Yeah, I know you have a big plan for your company where you want to be, but as I said earlier, it is also a challenge of humans, of having engineers available to, to you. So. Make sure that you have a, a small team that focuses on one particular business problem that you always wanted to solve. Yeah, I, I recently met with a, um, a large shipping company in uh, in Singapore. Mm. They came also with this idea, oh, we need to change everything. Our IT systems are older than that we are. But then said, well, why don't we start small? What's one problem that you always wanted to solve? And their problem was they wanted to know where the empty containers were. And they go like, don't you know that? Apparently not. They went through mergers and acquisitions and they had 20 different data silos and things like that. So having a small team using cloud technology, starting to aggregate that data together, they're able to figure out that they were 50% overscaled in terms of their empty containers, Mm -hmm. immediately serving $300 million a year, which is a story you can tell to your board, who then are willing to start investing in sort of, why don't we start building a bigger team? Yeah, why don't we start building up these learnings over time with this new technology such that we can help other parts of our business, and whether that is data-driven decision-making or whether it's building new services, to really move fast based on cloud computing. So from a, um, a CTO perspective, what is the future of cloud computing? You know, we've, we've been building lots of smaller building blocks. Such that because one of the reasons for that approach was that I didn't want to build something that was based on the technologies from five years ago. I really think that technology development was going to change. Mm-hmm. And so you need to be ready for how to develop in 2025 instead of in 2015. So all these smaller building blocks we've created now, we have well over 200 of those. But there's many customers that actually, yeah, they, they like these building blocks if, they're, if they have a good technology division. But many definitely look at SMBs, for example. They're, they don't have a technology division. They just want a solution. They want a data uh, uh, analytics solution. They want a disaster recovery solution. They see more and more of these solutions being built in the cloud, whether AWS builds them or our partners build them. We have a very rich partner ecosystem also here in Vietnam that helps customers build these, get these solutions in their hands. The, the other side of it, and especially I think this is important, for example, in Southeast Asia, where there are many, many, sm- many more small and medium businesses than probably anywhere else in, the, in, the, in, in the world. They don't have IT departments, but if you're a small, um, small and boutique hotel, for, for example, maybe in the past you had a PC with some installed software on it and there's some guy that comes on a Friday afternoon, hopefully, to make a backup. You, we see all of those small and medium businesses moving to a software as a service model. Meaning that, for example, uh, for these hotels, there's a service called Hotelogic that gives you immediately the capabilities that the biggest hotels have as well without that you have to install software. And you can access this over the internet and immediately get yourself inserted into the Expedias and the kayaks of this world, such as you can compete with the biggest hotels. And whether that is in in transportation or whether that is in, in, in hospitality or in restaurants, we see that the level of software that these companies can use through software as a service, running in the cloud, of course, yeah, actually allows them to compete with the companies that do have these massive IT departments. Yeah. So speaking of that, what would be your biggest challenge for AWS looking forward? Um, I think helping our customers train. Yeah, f- on one hand, you know, we're working here, for example, with universities here in Vietnam. We have well over 100 courses in Vietnamese, um, helping engineers get to the level of that, the knowledge that they need to have, such that 
immediately companies can hire them. These days, if you're a software engineer being trained at the university, you have no worry about job security. Yeah? Right. Companies are knocking on your door on day one. So for us, it is make sure that these young engineers actually have the appropriate training making sure that they're proficient in the capabilities what cloud can do so that they can help their, their, their bosses make the right technology decisions. And that's becoming more and more important. There's a Jeff Lawson, the CEO of Twilio, uh, a big technology company in, in the US, wrote a book. It says, Ask Your Developer. Mm -hmm. It's basically a business book. It, it advises CEOs to start talking to their engineers to really listen to them because they're the ones that understand what modern technology can bring and how they can actually drive this digital transformation. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that you need to get the Accentures and the McKinsey's in. You can actually just talk to your engineers because mm -hmm. if they're well trained, they can help you. Yeah. Any plan for the um, collaboration with the developers community here in Vietnam in the future? Well, we have two very, very extensive user groups right. here in Vietnam. People are so passionate about cloud computing right. that they build their own support organizations. Nice. Yeah, and we have we have an organization also which we call AWS Heroes. Those are unique individuals in the com community that really spend enormous amount of time and passion to actually drive cloud computing acceptance in the community. And we have AWS Heroes here in Vietnam as well. Yep. How do Vietnam play in your strategic map of development for Amazon? Um, well, I think in general, I think we're looking at Vietnam as becoming a powerhouse in software development. Yeah, I think really what I'm seeing, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a significant portion of the population is under 35 mm. with an excellent education, especially in technology. And I see Vietnam taking over some of the roles that India used to have, yeah, where sort of the big outsourcing companies used to be active. But if you want to have build a mobile app these days, you don't go to India, you go to Vietnam. Right. Yeah. And so I see Vietnam rising as a powerhouse mm -hmm. in software development because we've got very young, well-educated people that are capable of doing this for you. Glad to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing and uh, good luck with your journey here Thank in you. Vietnam. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Uh, that's the uh, sharing from uh, Dr. Werner Vargos, uh, the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer from Amazon. Uh, I believe uh, we have a lot of information to digest today. You can always watch the video again. Uh, I believe that uh, cloud computing can help speed up the digital transformation journey for a lot of businesses in Vietnam uh, with less investment cost. And um, thanks to the Amazon Web Services uh, present here in Vietnam, they are helping a lot of companies here in, in Vietnam to, to scale and uh, applying technology into a uh, better business result. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please uh, support us by subscribing to our channel, Via Success, or follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts to listen to this conversation anywhere or anytime. Thank you. Appreciate Perfect. it.